So that's my, that's my six-fold process and step and journey. And so somebody says, so you do every bit of that before you ever stand up to teach? Or I said, yep, you got to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And, and as much as and as long as I've taught, I still say to myself when I pick up a biblical text, Kanoi, you probably are wrong <laughs> about whatever conclusion it is that you have come to previously. Own that. Now listen and see what God may tell you in this. Hello. Welcome to Great Bible Teacher Interviews. I'm Rick Jordan. Each week I have the opportunity to interview a scholar, an author, or a practitioner about the Bible, about biblical interpretation, or spiritual formation. Today I'm very pleased to present to you the interview I had with Dr. Robert Canoy, who is the Dean and Professor of Theology at Gardner-Webb University's School of Divinity in Bowling Springs, North Carolina. Robert and I have known each other a pretty long time and have had great conversations together. He is going to talk today about basic principles of hermeneutics, how to interpret the Bible. Robert began in North Carolina and Shelby, North Carolina as pastor of First Baptist Church there, and then began teaching at the School of Divinity in the year 2000. He got his undergraduate degree from Mississippi, and then went to seminary at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, where he got his MDiv and his PhD. I hope you'll enjoy this interview and learn something more about how to interpret the Bible. Welcome to Great Bible Teachers. Thank you for being willing to give us some time today. Well, thank you, Rick. I'm, I'm honored to have been asked and to be a part of the conversation with you. Well, thank you. Uh, I always begin our interviews asking about great Bible teachers in our interviewers, interviewees' uh, life. So for you, who has shaped you? Uh, who's been a great Bible teacher, one or more, uh, in your life? Yeah, I, I, there actually have been a couple of them in my life. Um, having grown up, well, I didn't grow up in a Christian home necessarily. I did not become a Christian until I was about 12 years old. So all of my exposure to Bible and or Bible teaching, you know, came from the local church. My, uh, my boyhood pastors were, I mean, they, they, were, they were good ministers and all, uh, but I wouldn't say they were, you know, what, what I would call gifted, you know, biblical expositors. Mm-hmm. although we did have Bible studies quite regularly and they did lead them. It wasn't until I got to college and I attended college at Mississippi College, which was a Baptist college and still is. And uh, Robert Sheridan, uh, that's a name that is familiar to many. He actually is a brother to Buddy Sheridan. Uh, Robert Sheridan uh, was one of the professors, professor of New Testament at Mississippi College. And, um, and, and he, he inspired me um, in terms of his capacity to teach um, out of and using both the Greek text and the English text. Um, I can't say that it was any particular style of teaching that he used necessarily that that captured my imagination as much as the content. And uh, he simply saw things that I had never seen before, nor had I ever been exposed to in the biblical text and was able to convey that in such a way that it, uh, it captured my imagination. And I, and I remember thinking, wow, if I could ever do something like that, that would be, uh, that would be an incredible uh, gift and a great joy to me. Of course, I did not know enough at that point uh, to have anything to say, <laughs> but he, 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 again, was just a terrific teacher and a great encourager, highly demanding. He never, he never took it easy uh, on any of us as students uh, in that day. Never mind the fact that, as it turns out, he's from my, my own hometown. And he and my dad were childhood buddies. Little did I know that wow. back before either of them were Christians. Uh, but that said, he, I think, maybe took it. Uh, he was probably more challenging uh, to me than he would otherwise have been since I guess he knew my background. But at any rate, uh, he was a great teacher. Um, when I transitioned, obviously, from undergrad uh, work to seminary uh, and inevitably into Ph.D. work, um, I had some great teachers. Uh, 
David Garland, a well-known uh, uh, voice uh, uh, in Baptist life, now, now retired. Alan Culpepper, they, they were all my teachers. Dale Moody, they were, my, they were all my teachers. But I, I would have to say that the, the teacher uh, who has influenced me the most and has helped me more than anyone be, be a, if I am, be a good teacher, it was William Hendricks. Um, he came to Southern Seminary uh, after I was already in the PhD program and uh, asked and I agreed to serve as his teaching fellow, which meant I sat in on every class that he taught and I watched with fascination as he, um, he delivered his content and captivated the audience. And I, and I do mean captivated the audience. Um, he did so uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a fascinating way. Uh, he always uh, would begin a theological uh, discipline or discussion by providing definitions. That was always essential for him. And from definitions, he would then turn to biblical material. And from biblical material, he would enter the icy waters of church history. And then he would uh, conclude with a theological reconstruction. So that was simply his method, his style, uh, and, and the content in which he, uh, he did what he did. Now, of course, his personality was captivating for lots of reasons. He was a true Renaissance man. Um, he taught uh, never using a single note, which always fascinated me from start to finish throughout the entirety of Christian theology, a full two semesters of it. Um, he was encyclopedic in his uh, his capacity to manage all of that and to remember where it was he had dropped off two days earlier if the class was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class and could pick right up and never miss a beat. Uh, it was it was just fascinating to watch him in action. Mm -hmm. And so I learned uh, just tremendous uh, amounts of information from him. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Quite the teacher. <laughs> Every uh, discipline has its lingo. And one of the words that uh, we might use for Bible study is hermeneutics, which uh, is a new word probably for people who have not gone to seminary. What, what is hermeneutics? And then uh, I've asked you to share some basic principles uh, that have to do with that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, hermeneutics is a, is, is a beautiful word. In, in fact, uh, William Hendricks, to whom I'll just step back for a moment again to connect to this, uh, to, to connect the dot to where we are now. Um, he was also um, a linguist or a philologist, which means, you know, you take words are actually constructed from uh, other words. Our words in English, theology is a good example, comes from two Greek words, theos, logos, obviously meaning words about God. Um, hermeneutics is precisely one of those words. Uh, in fact, uh, hermeneutics comes from two Greek words as well. First half of the word seems rather obvious, Hermes, Hermes. The second half of the word has to do more with the science of, we would use maybe those words in English to describe. So the science of Hermes, now what that means is, if you remember from your Greek mythology who Hermes was, Hermes was the messenger of the gods. In other words, if Zeus spoke, no mortal could hear Zeus's words, let alone be in Zeus's presence, not even experience the breath of Zeus on them without disintegrating. Of course, in the Old Testament biblical story, a similar point is being made. A person could never see God and live. Well. Hermes became the messenger, the go-between, between the message that Zeus and or other gods wanted to communicate to a mortal, to a human being. So we use the word hermeneutic to talk about how one moves from what is said to its meaning. So when we talk about Bible or theology, we have lots of words. We have uh, loaded language that, that we know full well about uh, being part of the, of the guild, so to speak. But others who are outside uh, you know, our, our world or our network of thinking might not necessarily know it, for which reason the work of hermeneutics needs to take place. This science of transitioning from the words, and we might even call it the then, to the now. So how do we transition from the biblical words from long ago and in very different kinds of cultures 
to its meaning today. That's, that's the science of hermeneutics. Mm -hmm. um, I have my own way of doing that, uh, which if you uh, want to transition to hear how I do that, I'm, I'm glad to go there now, unless you want to uh, follow up about Hermes. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't know that, by the way. That's interesting to me. The, I, I figure is our, some Greek word that meant something else. I didn't realize it would relate to a Greek god, so that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is fascinating. Uh, I say to my theology classes, I, you know, like if we're looking at the, um, at the doctrine of salvation in English, that of course is called soteriology. Uh, soter obviously means savior, uh, and it's the words about the savior, the words about salvation and the like. And so I often say, like most good like most good English words, they have Greek in the background. <laughs> so, 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 you know, language is so important. And of course, our conversation we're having now, we're using language, we're using words. Mm -hmm. And persons, of course, when they hear words, automatically begin to assume things about the words that they're hearing based upon hearing them. So here, here, is, the, here is the hermeneutical process or the hermeneutical journey that I, in every class I teach, I, I insist and uh, require of students to learn these. And I even say, when the thunder claps in the middle of the night and you awake bolt upright from your stupor, say these words, pretext, text, context, precedent, practice, principle. And they say, slow down, what did you say? Well, here is the six-fold hermeneutical process. The first of which is pretext pre as in hyphenated text, pretext. That is every one of us as people, um, before we ever hear any words, we have a whole pretextual history or story that either rightly or wrongly informs the words that we're hearing when they come to us. I would use as an example, if I said the word plant, P-L-A-N-T, simple word, plant. And I do this often in classes. I use that word and I go around the room and I say, now, what did you hear when I said that word? And the options range across four or five possibilities. Some saw a little green things, you know, sitting in a, you know, in a pot, they saw a potted plant. Others uh, saw someone literally doing the work of planting something in the ground. Others saw a manufacturing plant at which they or a parent or someone that they know uh, worked one day. Um, and once we've kind of knocked around a few ideas, I'd say, yeah. And what you don't know is, and then I just randomly pick out someone in the back of the class, I'll say, Rick, sitting back there in the back corner, he's a plant. The mm -hmm. president of the university has planted him in this classroom <laughs> to make sure that what Kanoi is, ta is talking about isn't just wacky and crazy. <laughs> and then I say to them, now notice what just happened. I said but one word, plant, and look at all of the things that persons in this room heard. Now imagine when you read the Bible, the moment someone reads a word, you have a whole pretextual story that either rightly or wrongly informs your understanding of what the word is that you just heard. So what I tell everyone, we must all first do business with our pretext before we ever open the text. And then I say now, surprise of all surprises, assume, assume for the sake of learning that whatever you have thought a word that you're about to hear means assume that it's wrong. Hmm. Don't, don't assume that you already know what it means. Assume that it's wrong. Just for the sake of opening yourself to the possibility of learning and discovering something that may clearly have been there all along, but that you had never seen before. And that exercise ordinarily proves successful for persons as they are now beginning to hear words. So from this first uh, principle, this first pretext, one then moved to the text. And by text, we mean the words, the words that we're hearing. When it comes to the Bible, of course, it's easy enough to establish what that text is. 
We have an Old Testament. We have a New Testament, a First Testament, Second Testament. We have a Greek text. We have a Hebrew text. We have, we have all of this. And I say so to students, or students of the Bible, look at this text. Realize that the English text that we, we read is not necessarily the first text. It stands upon and is a translation of either a Greek or a Hebrew text or an Aramaic text for certain parts of Daniel. Uh, it stands upon and is a, and, and hermeneutics has been involved in moving what? Those Hebrew Greek terms into English terms. And even the English language itself changes over time, for which reason we have to be aware that even when we're reading the text, that does not satisfy, nor does it settle the whole matter of meaning. We've dealt with our pretext now, and now we're looking at a text. And then I will illustrate often enough and can do so with you now. I remember when I, uh, I transitioned away from reading the King James Bible to reading, uh, then I think it was Revised Standard Version. And I said it had nothing to do and has nothing to do with the beauty or the truthfulness of the King James Bible, but it had everything to do with my pretext when I hear certain words. And it was that scene in uh, Acts chapter 28 when Paul had been at sea and there'd been a shipwreck or a, a shipwreck was approaching and he's describing it. And there is a word found in the 28th chapter uh, that Paul actually uses are an expression. And this was, the, this was the expression. And we fetched a compass. That was the expression. And so I asked congregations or people, what did you hear when I just said we fetched a compass? And most of them say, well, it sounds like somebody went down somewhere in the ship and got a compass so they could know which direction to, you know, to turn to, you know, to get themselves out of this storm because they couldn't see the stars, they couldn't see, you know, whatever. I say, well, that's, that's ordinarily what most of us think. But in reality, fetching a compass is a 19th and earlier British century nautical term, which means to lock the ship's rudder in such a, a, such a manner that the, that the ship runs a circular course until the storm passes. I said, now you see, the problem is not with the King James Bible, nor with its words, but it was with what? me, the listener, my pretext, wrongly informed and made me assume something about that word that even the English King James translators did not intend, nor did it mean. So we have to do, uh, do business with the text that we have. So the text is the second part. And of course, those who have facility in Greek or Hebrew or who learn those languages, I think are in a better position to move forward for understanding what those English words mean when they can look in back of those texts. And to be sure, we have great English translations today that are available uh, with lots of footnotes that talk about all the possibilities and options of the meanings of these words. So we must do business with the, with the text. So we got a pretext and we got a text, and then we have a context. So these words that we're reading, they all happen within a context. Someone has more accurately said Words do not so much have meaning as they have usages. So words, when they, are, when they are packaged together, depending on the sentence structure and the order of the words, will mean things and will bring meaning to things based upon their usage. So when we talk about context, there are you know, several, several you know, cogs in this wheel. The context includes the historical context which called forth this text originally. And it also means that we must read the words that we're talking about in question within the context of the biblical book at which we're looking. And, and, and this becomes a classic mistake in my estimation when people are reading the Bible. That is to assume that any word we read anywhere in the Bible means the same thing every time we read it elsewhere in the Bible. Hmm. Classic example would be the word flesh. Paul can talk about flesh in terms of skin and bone, but he also can talk about flesh in terms of a spiritual orientation for living life. These words do not mean the same thing. One must read them in their context to understand them. I sometimes illustrate as well uh, 
like the book of uh, Matthew will talk about uh, brothers. Inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. That passage from the parable in Matthew 25. And I, I, I ask people, who are the brothers? Who are these brothers? And the assumption often is any person is a brother. Well, if you read Matthew's gospel with any care, every single time brother is mentioned, it has to do with those who are part of the kingdom of God, who are part of the community of faith associated with Jesus. It doesn't just mean randomly in as much as you do this to anybody. It's rather when you go visit the brother who's in prison and you go visit others uh, who are the brothers and do these things. Again, it, what does it do? It gives us a different insight into the meaning found in the text. Now, there are other reasons, of course, that one could say you ought to do good things and right things to people, but don't use that text to do it. If you do, guess what you've done? You've taken brothers out of context. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to be guilty of that. So we have a pretext, a text, context, more about which we could say, but for the sake of our conversation, I'll just keep pushing forward. And then there's a fourth of these six steps in this hermeneutical process, and it's called precedent. And precedent, by that I mean precede, precedent. And what that means is, when I'm wrestling with and I'm trying to discover the meaning of something in a given text within its context, granted my pretext, I then ask myself, are there other biblical precedent prior to me reading this here that informs what I think I'm reading here or the conclusions that I've come to about what I'm reading? Are there other biblical texts? So we must do business, yes, with the whole of the biblical canon if, in fact, we're going to understand it. I mean, take, take a simple example of, um, of the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. How does it begin? the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here the word beginning, much like the prologue to the gospel of John. Um, um, in the beginning was the word. Well, when you hear the word beginning, guess what? There is a strong biblical precedent that traces you all the way back to Genesis 1-1 in the beginning. So that when you're hearing Mark or you're hearing John use this language, they are in every way connecting what you're about to hear in this particular biblical text with what you already know about God in the grand biblical tradition. So to be sure, it puts a pressure on us and puts a burden on us to know the whole biblical story, not just isolated pieces of it. So we must do business to be sure with the precedent before we come to any grand conclusion about what we're finding in the text. Now, all of this so far, you know, sounds pretty straightforward and sounds pretty obvious, uh, and, I, and I think it is. But inevitably, once we've looked at these four things, there is a fifth step that must likewise be taken, and it's called practice. Practice. What has been the practice of the Judeo-Christian tradition? What has been the practice of the church? relative to this particular topic or doctrine or conclusion to which I've come. Now, sometimes that one isn't quite as clear. We'll take a simple example like baptism. Well, guess what? There are lots of denominational precedents that are out there to which persons would want to look at and would, to which they would want to turn. But many people uh, will start with the practice and try to fit the what? The biblical precedent in its context, in its text, uh, all the way back to their pretext. They'll try to fit it that way instead of taking the journey from beginning, deal, doing business with their pretext, so as to say, hey, my thought about baptism might be wrong. Let's say that up front as our pretext, and then let's journey through the text, the context, of whatever, and then wonder how in the practice of the church we have come to the conclusion that we've come realizing that many times there's a, there's, a, there's a split here and some denominations will embrace this particular uh, viewpoint of baptism and others will the other. All of which are trying to get us to the sixth point, which is the principle. What is the principle being laid down or established 
sometimes in preaching we call this, I think Wayne Stacy was the first to use this expression, the governing theological theme. What is the governing theological theme that this text that we're reading is attempting to establish? In other words, we want to get to the principle here as best we can. So there's a six-step process. And, and you, can, you can read this um, you know, with some modifications. Peter Gomes uh, did a book. Uh, he was a long time, um, you know, something like dean of the chapel at, at Harvard uh, Divinity School uh, called The Good Book. And in it, uh, he uses some of these, uh, these, uh, these six-fold steps, but I, I don't think he includes pretext in this as he un unpacks this. And I say that ab above all else, pretext must be dealt with first, admitting that we may or may not be right at the outset. So that's my, that's my six-fold process and step and journey. And so somebody says, so you do every bit of that before you ever stand up to teach her? I said, yep, you got to deal with it. Mm -hmm. and, and as much as and as long as I've taught, I still say to myself when I pick up a biblical text, Kanoi, you probably are wrong <laughs> about whatever conclusion it is that you have come to previously. Own that. Now listen and see what God may tell you in this through the text, its context, the precedent, the practice, and the principle. Mm. Wow, so that is a lot of steps to take, but I, 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 I guess we probably assume that a commentary writer or our curriculum writer maybe has done this. Um, is that a, a mistaken assumption? Uh, if I'm a Bible teacher, uh, what, what, what should I assume that someone has already done for me that I, I don't have to learn Greek or, or you know, do some other training that I just don't have the time or ability to. Well, excellent point. You know, when it comes to the biblical languages, I mean, even persons who, you know, have been to seminary and who know some Greek or know some Hebrew, as we often say, uh, they know just enough Greek to be dangerous. <laughs> uh, and the assumption is, oh, wow, the person has just dropped a Greek or a Hebrew word on me. They somehow, what, have some kind of access to truth in a way I don't have it. So I must uh, always, uh, you know, defer to whatever they say because they happen to know Greek and they happen to know Hebrew. No, even even Greek scholars will sometimes admit, oh wow, you know, I thought wrongly about this for a long time. Mm -hmm. So the point is, uh, while you know, laypersons who are reading the Bible who teach Sunday school lessons and the like, I mean, we'd like to think that our curriculum writers, um, whoever they might be or the books that we read because they're in print form are always going to be right and are always going to tell us the exact truth. Um, and of course their intention always is to be truthful, but nevertheless, let's, uh, let's for the most part, at least take that first step and say pretextually, I don't want wrongly to assume that even the person who's telling me what this text means is necessarily right about this. And let's look at, how we have actually come or this person has come to the conclusions to which he or she as the writer has come. So I think it's always important to be, you know, a, a hermeneutic of, of suspicion, it sometimes it's called. Be mm. suspicious. Uh, nothing wrong with being suspicious. That doesn't mean that uh, you're being unkind, but it means you're just uh, wanting to know the truth about uh, whatever it is, you know, you're reading or studying. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I guess a part of the point too is that you, you start with the scripture. Uh, don't, don't start with somebody else's interpretation of the scripture, but start reading and pondering the scripture for yourself first. Well, excellent point. I mean, Baptists historically have been called people of the book. Uh, of course, I grew up along, I grew up in church and I, I saw more Bible waving than I actually saw, actually saw Bible reading. I mean, people would, you know, they wanted the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, but look, let's open it and let's read it. But again, let's be careful in our reading it to, to, to be aware that when you read a biblical text, you, you must pay attention to genre. I haven't used that word yet, but the genre of the text, you don't read a parable the same way you read another piece of didactic, uh, you know, materials that are found in the text. You have to know what kind of uh, uh, form or style of writing is being used, and, uh, parable being an example, 
metaphor being an important word in all of this. Uh, the Bible is highly metaphorical. Uh, mm. That means, of course, and what is a metaphor? Well, it's something that stands alongside something to, to make it clear. And uh, you, you never take a metaphor literally. It always has, a, has literal components about it, but you never take it literally. You take it too seriously. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. And Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Mm. When I'm dealing with a person who, you know, his, who is an avowed literalist, I'll say, you're not. And they'll say, well, I am. And I'll say, well, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Is that whole wheat, rye, or pumpernickel? <laughs> and they usually get the point, you know, because this is metaphorical speech. And uh, we have to be aware of what kind of language we are reading when we actually are uh, taking up the biblical text. Mm. Another um, couple of words that are in the lingo of this particular discipline uh, is eisegesis and exegesis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What do you do with those terms? Yeah. Eisegesis has historically been understood to mean a reading into the text, something that isn't in the text. Exegesis is a taking out of the text, something that is in the text. Um, so in many ways, um, uh, we're back to pretext. So one's pretext says, I already know what this means. So because I already know what it means, I'm going to what? I'm going to smuggle my ideas, my preconceived notions. I'm going to smuggle those into the text, eisegete it, make it say what I want it to say. It's a bit like a person to my caution who have a sermon ready for the preaching. They're just looking for a biblical text. <laughs> so in other words, they already have what, they've already decided what they want to say. They're just hunting a Bible text uh, to, uh, to give some credence to what, uh, what they're otherwise going to say anyway. So that's called eisegesis. That's sticking into the text something that isn't necessarily there. Exegesis is, uh, is a more uh, technical term that, that we hear often and use often in, you know, in divinity school or seminary or whatever, saying let's exegete the passage. Let's take every single word. Let's take it apart. Let's, uh, you know, let's break it down. Let's look at it. Uh, and based upon our taking everything apart, now let's think that we've come to the conclusion about it. And uh, exegesis is uh, it's not a bad word, but unfortunately, plenty of teachers are good at taking a thing apart. And guess what? When they're done taking it apart, here are all the scattered parts. And they've done a masterful job of scattering all the parts of the biblical text before the listeners but they never come to the principle. Mm. I, chuckle with, I chuckle with my biblical scholars, and my own background is an odd one, I, I admit this. I'm both a theologian and a biblical person, and that's pretty unusual to have both because the Bible people are always nervous that the theologians are, have already decided what they want to say anyway and will come to the Bible and hope to make the Bible say it. And the theologians are always saying to the Bible people, what does it mean? So you've taken it all apart and you've scattered all the parts everywhere, but you've not helped me come to any conclusions about what it means. Mm -hmm. So exegesis for all the good that it is in taking everything apart does not always come around to the, uh, to the, uh, to, to establishing any kind of principle in the text. Mm -hmm. You say a word about uh, you and I are both uh, middle upper class, white, male, educated uh, persons. Uh, but we know that when a person from a different ethnicity or cultural background, nationality, uh, economic status, when they come to the scripture, then they, I don't know if that would be under the pretext idea, uh, maybe it is, but they, they, they and we approach the scripture, just when we open it, we already have all these social ideas uh, yeah. that we were nourished with that influence our interpretation. Excellent point. Um, for which reason, I think we do our best work in community of diversity. Mm. Because as you've said, uh, persons from different uh, social, economic, language, ethnic background, may in fact see different things in the text 
that persons from uh, outside of that particular ethnic, uh, whatever de demographic may not see. And it's in conversation that together we can see things that we would not otherwise see. Uh, I'll illustrate, I, I saw this perhaps as clearly personally when I was serving a congregation in the Washington DC area. In that congregation, uh, we had flags hanging across the back of the sanctuary. Now, the reason we had flags hanging across the back of the sanctuary, those flags were representative of all of the nation's peoples represented in the congregation. There mm. were 42 of them. Wow. So we had people from 42 different countries in the membership of that church. Wow. Now, you talk about it being challenging on Sunday morning to preach, illustrate, teach, using whatever metaphorical expression you might use, knowing that you had this plethora of, of diversity out there. And that was beautiful. It was Pentecost Sunday every Sunday, uh, <laughs> but, but it made it challenging. While I was there, um, I took advantage of a couple of uh, events that happened um, over in the Baltimore area at one of the uh, Roman Catholic seminaries. Uh, each uh, Advent season and each Lent season and the approach to it, uh, we would meet uh, area ministers and people would be invited, at which would be a Christian scholar, um, uh, a Muslim scholar, and a Jewish scholar. And guess what? We would sit together and look at the biblical texts that were going to be proclaimed uh, during that, those uh, strategic seasons of the year. And it was fascinating to watch um, as our teachers from the different denominational families and the different religious families uh, looked at and explored these texts and, uh, and demonstrated what pretextually uh, one of the others of them saw or failed to see that others now saw differently as a result of seeing it. Mm -hmm. And a, a quick illustration was um, toward the close of Genesis chapter 11, before you get to chapter 12, here is Abram, Abraham. Um, little did I know that uh, only in the latter part of chapter 11, when uh, Abraham is actually leaving Ur and leaving his family behind, um, he does so on the occasion of what we find the first reported death since the flood. In the whole of the biblical story, there has not been a recorded or reported death since the flood. Now, you see, that's something that you don't see or think. I, I don't, but our Jewish teacher um, actually pointed this out to us because, again, our, you know, our Jewish friends have been reading the Bible for a long, much longer time than we as Christians have been reading it and looking at and slicing and dicing and angling every part of the biblical story in every imaginable way. Uh, I mean, what does that do? That heightens the whole drama within the narrative itself. So, so the, these, these become illustrations, and, and your question is a fine one. When do we do our best biblical work? When do we do our best uh, hermeneutical work? It's precisely when we do it in a community of conversation. Uh, now, that's valuable, and that's important, but, but I always caution us when we do such a thing as that in our own particular little shops. And what I mean by that is, I know some people who think they've had a great Sunday school lesson, when we've surfaced all the issues and everybody's had a chance to speak. Everybody felt good that they had a chance to have their say. There's nothing wrong with having a say, but let's be clear. Not every voice that speaks, speaks with the same level of clarity um, about the text in question that we're reading. And it's always good to hear each other. Uh, and I always encourage listening to and hearing each other. So learning how to have this dialogue learning how to have this conversation uh, in a positive way, in a non-threatening, non-judgmental way, uh, that becomes, I think, the key to being a good teacher, is how to focus and refocus and shape and reshape the odd question that maybe sometimes comes out of the blue that seemingly has no real bearing on what's in question here. A good teacher is able to turn that question in a positive way so that it ultimately gets to the principle that the text seemingly is trying to establish. Mm. Let me ask you about along this line, then um, you're in a group, a small group, 
And there are different interpretations of a particular passage, let's say. Um, you know, the, the temptation might be to say, well, this is the Christian answer to this, this uh, interpretation or this text. Uh, this is the Christian way of, of looking at it. Um, how does one discern what the Christian way of looking at a passage is? The Christian, by that I mean, uh, you know, this is the orthodox, or this is the right way of interpreting it. Well, for me, um, I, I, as I've tried to indicate through my little hermeneutical journey that I take people on, well, let, let's decide if this is the Christian way based upon our having traversed this avenue of pretext, text, context, et cetera, et cetera. It, admitting as we do that there may be things that we don't yet know, things that uh, we should know that might inform our conclusions differently, and trying to avoid um, saying, you know, it's, uh, it's so-called my way or the highway. In other words, if you disagree with me, then suddenly you're unorthodox. Um, and if you're unorthodox, then you no longer have a seat at the table for conversation. And we've all certainly seen churches and have been in, uh, been in places where that's happened. And that's unfortunate uh, that, um, uh, that that should ever take place, which in my estimation is the best indication that this isn't Christian <laughs> because uh, being Christian should mean there's room at the table for everyone to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus did, never dismissed anybody except those people who thought they already had the answer to all the questions. He never dismissed people for asking questions or people who were wrong or people even whose morality was in question. He never dismissed them. You know, again, the only ones he ever dismissed were those who had no interest in hearing anything other than what they'd already, already always thought or had already, always been told. So in my mind, we have to be careful about that and uh, not, not to, and, and try to walk a, a different, high, a higher ground in that matter. I don't mm -hmm. know if I've answered your question, but that's what comes to mind. No, I think that's good that we, we allow people to, to have different interpretations. You know, we don't, don't insist that they're, my interpretation is the inerrant one. Uh, right, right. And actually, um, you know, what I interpret this to mean this week, something may happen in this next week that helps me, makes me rethink what interpretation of that uh, same text might have meant. Yeah, life certainly has a way of doing that, doesn't it? Yes. And, uh, I mean, there, there aren't any number of examples that come to mind. I, you know, I, a, a word that we often have to deal with, uh, you know, that Paul uses is the word slave, mm -hmm. doulas. So some are just, uh, we'll say, well, let's just, let's just use a different word. Let's just use servant instead yeah. of doulas because, uh, or slave, because slave, you know, smacks of all, with all kind of heavy connotations. Again, pretext comes to play because little, little do most people know there were at least four different ways that a person could become a slave, four different ways. Mm -hmm. And most people, American people, read it through the, through the lens of the American travesty of slavery, mm -hmm. uh, which is hardly what the biblical text was all about. Mm -hmm. The biblical text of Paul's day would speak of slavery quite differently because Paul would talk about himself being a slave because Paul knew that he had, he had run up a high debt, a sin debt that he could not pay himself out of. Mm. And one of the ways that persons became slaves in the first century world was to indenture themselves when they had run up such a tab that they could not pay. They would indenture themselves to a wealthy benefactor and they would work for that wealthy benefactor until such time as their benefactor had initially paid off their debt and then they paid off the benefactor for paying off their debt. That's mm -hmm. a different kind of slavery. So persons became slaves for lots of different ways. And Paul undoubtedly had in his mind a different form of slavery when he said, look, slaves, if you're a slave, keep on being a slave because guess what? You haven't paid your debt yet. Mm. Pay your master, 
as you're supposed to pay your master. Now, other ways that you became a slave was as a result of war, we know that, or to have been born to a slave. I mean, we know all of those things that are there, but again, we unfortunately let our pretext often disturb and ill-inform our conclusions. So it doesn't mean we should throw the words out, we just want correctly to uh, explain these words, what these words mean. I want to thank Dr. Robert Canoy for sharing his insights and wisdom with us about interpreting the Bible. Some takeaways for me include being honest that when we approach the text, we approach it with all kinds of preconceptions. So the honesty is to say to the Holy Spirit, I have these preconceptions, help me see something fresh and new as I approach this text. And then of course we have Robert's six steps of how to interpret the Bible and the encouragement to go through each of these steps before we actually teach. I thank him again for his uh, sharing with us. If you would like to learn more about other interviews and blogs about teaching the Bible, then I encourage you to sign up for the e-newsletter. You can do that through greatbibleteachers.com go to the website and you can sign up to receive a email on Tuesday about a blog article. And then on Thursday, we post the interviews.